Um, so I actually got to meet Sacha through uh, Joe, who actually writes these really interesting LinkedIn posts about TinyML related to sound. And so that's why I was like, wow, like these people really seem to understand sound because, you know, Joe would often, uh, his, uh, Joe is one of Sacha's colleagues. Um, so he would post a lot of these really interesting tidbits uh, about how you need to think about sound or interesting use cases from just like, you know, collecting sound data and being able to do something with that. And that got me to actually connecting with audio analytic folks a couple of months ago. And I said, hey, like, you know, it'll be awesome since you all are such experts in sound, like maybe it would be interesting for you all to come out and kind of talk about what it means to actually collect data sets for sound and actually try and engineer tiny ML systems specifically for sound. Um, so that's how I got to meet Sacha, um, who works at Audio Analytics. Um, he's written a lot of papers in the space. He's also given lots of uh, lectures and keynotes on this topic. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Sacha. And I'm hoping the students uh, are going to ask you some good questions. Uh, and uh, I've already seen some of Sacha's slides, which look excellent. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Sacha. All right. Thank you very much, Vijay, for this, uh, for this introduction. Um, I'm just going to try to share my, my screen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I will share also the sound because we're going to have some uh, some sound uh, examples uh, during the talk. Um, all right. Can you all see that? Okay. Give me the thumbs up, uh, the virtual thumbs up, if you can. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so yes, thank you very much, uh, Vijay and team, for the for the introduction. Thank you all for um, um, coming to this class uh, today. Uh, I've seen Brian give you a good shot of adrenaline with all the assignments and stuff, but let's just uh, enjoy uh, these, these 45 minutes. I hope you're going to find it uh, at the same time informative and uh, entertaining a bit. What we're going to talk about is data collection design for real world tiny ML. And we, we're going to, I'm going to come back to what I mean with uh, real world. Uh, I'm the director of A-Labs, which is the uh, research division of a company Audio Analytic. Uh, so Audio Analytic does like a Shazam for real world sounds. So that's technically inaccurate. We don't use the same algorithm as, as Shazam, but it's a quick way to say that what we're doing is uh, automatic sound recognition for computers. Um, this is our team. We're about 50 people at the moment. Uh, we're based in Cambridge in the UK, uh, and we have an office also in San Francisco. Um, to date, we've raised uh, $20 million in funding. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, our own uh, patent family covering uh, sound recognition. So uh, what do we mean by uh, real world? First of all, setting the scene, setting the, the context of what we're doing. You're all familiar, especially through this course, with many, many applications of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So you've heard about speech, uh, speech AI for dialogue systems, wake work recognition, or, or uh, biometric voice recognition, recognizing people's identity through their voices. You're also uh, going to have, I think, uh, talks about uh, image AI, uh, which is employed for face recognition or for video processing. You can detect a whole lot of things in also in the Tesla cars. The, the, most of the uh, sensing is being done by uh, video processing. Um, you're probably familiar. You probably all have either Shazam or Soundhound in your phone to identify music automatically. But to me, uh, when I started with audio analytics, there was one missing piece to that puzzle, which is sound artificial intelligence. We do lots of things with, uh, with our ears. Uh, and so you can focus either on recognizing the sounds, particular sounds themselves, which are indicators of context. When you cross the road, you're going to hear the cars coming. So that's going to give you an indication of context, whether it's safe or not to cross the road. Um, sounds trigger your attention. If you have a bank somewhere, you're going to look around. What is it? Uh, it's indicative of presence of people. If your security camera is switched off, you can still hear stuff in the dark. Um, and so on and so forth. So that's for particular sounds, but you can also recognize whole scenes. If you are, uh, say, uh, in the street, it sounds different than if you're at home, or if you are in airport, you're going to have different kinds of uh, sound scenes, so at atmospheres to what is happening around you. Uh, and it's interesting to give uh, machines uh, capability to exploit uh, uh, sounds happening or the scene happening around you. Uh, so what we do um, as a company um, is um, uh, this. So I'm just trying to move the uh, space. There we go. So um, we have built a, a pipeline. So similarly to uh, what Vijay was talking about, uh, a whole pipeline for uh, data collection, labeling, training, and so on. Uh, what we sell is the product of that, which is um, a product called AI3 Microinference Platform, which is a piece of software, uh, which is tiny. 
uh, and which goes into uh, a, which is run embedded into a variety of devices. Uh, so I will come back to which kind of devices we run. Uh, and so two of the very important elements of what we're doing are Alexandria, which is the trademark for our data set, uh, and Auditory Net, which is our uh, super secret uh, DNN architecture for sound recognition. But what we sell is the uh, the, the piece of software which is the, the product of all that training and so on. Uh, so devices where um, our, our, our software uh, is running. So by 2021, you're going to have 230 million smart home devices. So that includes cameras, that includes smart, all sorts of things, thermostats, uh, 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 light switches, and so on. Uh, you're going to have 206 million smart speakers uh, across a variety of brands. You're going to have 82 million hearables, so uh, headphones with uh, smart capabilities to them. Uh, 92 million connected cars, 1.7 billion smartphones. And uh, in this kind of object, sound recognition is a key strategic technology that should be made available in all connected devices. That's going to give them that extra dimension that makes them more useful and smarter. So examples of uh, such devices uh, that I can talk about are uh, this one, which is the Hive Hub 360. That's uh, Hive is a smart home company based in the UK. Uh, they're a subsidiary of uh, British Gas the energy company. Um, and uh, they made this device, which is a connection hub for all your smart devices in the home, your light switches, your thermostats, and so on. They all communicate through this device. But the latest generation of this device now has a microphone and is listening to the, what's happening uh, in your home and is detecting glass breaks or uh, smoke alarms to uh, uh, indicate, to send you an alert if there is any safety issue uh, in your home environment. Uh, this is another example. This is a French brand called Free. They do uh, set-top box internet uh, boxes. Um, so that brings internet to your home, but because there is lots of competition between internet providers, they are trying to put more and more and more services in the same device. So that started with the phone, then the TV. Uh, now they have designed that one, which is, uh, has very good quality audio playback. And the latest thing they included uh, to, to, again, add value to this device is, is sound uh, recognition. And again, I think on this one, it's the uh, smoke alarm and glass break recognition for security applications in your home. Uh, this is a different class of device. So these are hearables. Those are the braggy uh, earbuds. Uh, so the one thing which is really interesting with hearables, especially when they sit in your ear, is that they are a kind of interface between uh, what comes into your auditory system and then the environment. And you can build very, very interesting uh, concepts around that. For example, um, the uh, smart listening. Uh, or selective listening that would let through only the sounds which are of interest, only the ones that you want to hear. Uh, and in order to achieve that, you need to be able to recognize the sounds, that their occurrence, to be able to select uh, when you want to uh, open or close the transparency of the, of, of the headphones. So these are just three examples of uh, real world application. But what about the machine learning aspect of that? So first of all, uh, one thing which is important for any kind of machine learning is to really understand what phenomenon you're dealing with. Uh, when you're processing speech, the way speech is produced is you have the vocal cords vibrating and then the sound of vocal cords, which is not very differentiated, gets shaped by your vocal tract into vowels and into, uh, into speech, essentially. Uh, it's a similar process with music instruments. Uh, you have a reed or a strings which are vibrating and that vibration is being shaped in various ways by the resonance uh, cavity of the instrument. It could be a pipe for a saxophone, it could be a, a box with holes for, for, a, for a violin, but it's essentially one type of production process, which is an excitation, which is shaped by uh, some, you could think of it as some kind of equalization of the, of the excitation, shaped into the variety of sounds that the, um, the, 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 the voice or the instrument can produce. Now, what about this one? Do you think it's the same production process? Yeah, obviously it's, got, it's as far as you can imagine from a shaped uh, ex excitation. Uh, it's uh, essentially a, a loud, very, very loud bang explosion. And then you have all the glass pieces. Uh, so depending on what uh, glass it is, this one uh, is gonna make little uh, crumbly noises as it falls. Uh, some other types of glass have big glass shards falling, which are making tingling sounds. Uh, so this is a completely different production process. So you can't really rely on similar techniques uh, as speech because the, the sounds, the phenomenon that you're dealing with is very different. Other examples, so those two, the, the vacuum cleaner or the, the shower uh, pouring water, 
again, nothing to do with resonance, nothing to do with the percussion uh, and, and uh, tingles. Uh, this is going to be a shape noise uh, type of sound. Uh, things like smoke alarms and microwave, those are appliance beeps. They're being produced by, a, um, by electronic circuits and then a, a cheap buzzer. Uh, and then this is another type of percussive sound, but without the aftermath of the uh, glass falling, if you have door knocks, there, uh, depending on the material of the door, it could be all sorts, it could sound all, all, all sorts of different ways. So, um, these gray diagrams here are called spectrograms. So, the, the x axis is the time axis, the y axis is the presence or absence of frequency components. So, for the smoke alarm sound, which I'm going to play right now, can you hear that? Thumbs up if you can. Thank you. So this is a very simple sound. I mean, seemingly very simple. You can see the three um, uh, lines are pure tones, okay? They're one single frequency, concentrated in one single frequency. Uh, and this uh, type of sound has, a, um, the, most of the information is on the uh, temporal sequence. We, we're going to come back to that in a minute. The glass break has that massive sudden bang at the start and then you can see little um, uh, also uh, horizontal lines which are the, the, the tingles of the, we call them tingles of the glass shards falling on the floor uh, and making a bit like little, uh, little, I don't know, gongs or something, little resonances. Uh, you might have harmonic sounds. So that was a violin and a baby cry, and they have what we call a harmonic structure, uh, which are those kind of parallel lines. In the case of the violin, they are parallel. In the case of the baby, they have this trajectory which corresponds to the melody of what the of what the baby of the way the baby is crying. Um, ah, and the. Ah. So this is a vacuum cleaner. You have that veil of uh, noise, and then uh, it happens that this one has a hiss in the middle, an uh, aerodynamic uh, sound, a bit like blowing a whistle in the middle of that kind of gray zone of noise. So what that illustrates is that uh, all these different production processes are, are, are uh, uh, yielding a variety of phenomena in your uh, audio for sound recognition. Um, so now, um, who thinks those, uh, do you think those sounds are the same thing or are different sounds? What do you think they are? I can't exactly see the, uh, the uh, chat window right now, but um, so yeah, anyway. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna play those two sounds. Give me someone else! So they're both vocal sounds, okay, with the harmonic structure that we saw before, but one is a baby cry and the other one is a female uh, shouting voice. Um, so looking at this, we, we, we have this uh, uh, feeling that they are similar sounds, okay, similar phenomenon. But now if we look at the temporal structure of these sounds, the baby cry, uh, the lungs of the babies are, are smaller than the human uh, lungs. So baby needs to take, uh, they need to take their uh, a breath uh, um, every so often at a particular rhythm which corresponds to uh, their lungs. Whereas uh, humans can be uh, speaking for a longer time. So in that case, what makes the difference between those two sounds is more the temporal pattern of the sound themselves than the uh, acoustic characteristics of the sound. And there we come back to uh, our smoke alarm. And this type of pattern of three beeps, which are note five or a second uh, each with a 0.5 of a second um, uh, um, gap in between, and then a one second gap between groups of three. This is called the T3 pattern. That's a pattern that is normalized um, for uh, security uh, devices, for smoke alarms in particular. So temporal uh, structure matters for sound recognition. Uh, Sasha, there's some questions. Um... Yes, so uh, yes, feel free to, um, interrupt me somehow with the audio because I, I can't see the, the, the chat window, but that, that, that's fine to ask me questions. So feel welcome to do that during the talk. Um, right, so um, real world effects don't stop uh, at uh, the sound themselves, okay? Sounds happen in the environment. So I'm, I'm giving this talk in my you know, garden office right now. 
uh, and um, every room um, or every space uh, has a, a response uh, when it comes to acoustic. Uh, so this picture is, uh, is the advertisement of a company which makes sound absorbers, ceiling mounted uh, sound absorbers. But uh, you can see what it, this illustrates is you might have different types of materials on the various surfaces of the room. Here you have a wooden floor. You probably have concrete walls or some kind of solid material for the walls. A very rigid material and those surfaces all have uh, what's called a reflectance, a reflection coefficient. Some of them are more absorbent, so if you have soft furnishings, curtains and so on, they absorb sounds. Uh, or uh, if you have uh, hard surfaces, uh, they reflect sound. Uh, so in terms of room effects, you have uh, reverberation, so sound bouncing off the various surfaces to various extents. You also have impulse response, so rooms themselves have a shape and they are like the body of these music instruments that you've seen before. They're going, each room with a different shape is going to equalize your sounds differently. So reverberation, uh, the equalization is called the impulse response of the, of the room. Uh, and then uh, you might be uh, in a room or you might be um, outdoors. If you're walking about with your uh, headphones uh, in the street, if you're in free field, you might have no reflection from the environment. But if you're walking in the street, you might have sounds bouncing from the various buildings around you or even from objects like cars and stuff. So this is the room response or the, the environment response in general. Then devices themselves have a response. They reshape the sounds in certain way. Uh, we're going to come back in a minute to the consumer grade microphones, but in, uh, in this kind of device, for example, the Hive One, you don't have a perfect microphone. You're going to have uh, off the shelf uh, MEMS microphones, which are mass produced. And those microphones uh, tend to be uh, imperfect and you have to cope with that for your application. Uh, you also have audio channel effects. So sometimes the electronics are generating self noise, um, either white noise or electromagnetic noise in the, in the audio. Uh, you also have all sorts of processing in terms of uh, resampling, encoding and so on, which is performed by electronics in there. And the device casing itself uh, is like one of these uh, instrument bodies. If the microphone is not mounted flush with the, with the microphone hole, uh, a device like this one is a cylinder. You might have resonances in there, which are corresponding to this kind of uh, phys physical resonances in this cavity. So you got to be careful uh, about all of that, but you won't be able to imagine any, everything that can happen. Uh, all this variability ends up into the data. So in the olden days, people were trying to uh, uh, form physical models of resonances, you know, all the physics of what's happening, but very quickly um, that became very, very complicated. So nowadays, the approach of choice is uh, to do uh, machine learning because uh, the, uh, instead of trying to explain every single reflection and thing and, and effect that's happening, we prefer to record the data which illustrate all that variability and then learn directly from the data without trying to make production models or physical models of, of what's happening. So uh, continuing with what defines reality for machine learning. So we've talked a bit about the phenomena and, uh, and the, 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 the data, I mean, in the context of audio uh, variability of sound. But something which is really important is to define the task that you want your system to achieve and to define the evaluation. How are you going to judge that the task is achieved by your system? Those two points are really, really important. Um, who has heard about the, the story of the DNN strain to recognize tanks? It's one of these old internet chestnuts. Anybody? Story is the following. So you had a Department of Defense, which shall remain unnamed, I'm not sure which country it was, which funded a project, big project, to, um, to uh, train a system able to, an AI able to recognize tanks in tank pictures. So they trained the system and so on, and then when they put the system in the field, um, it completely failed, like whereas it had, I don't know, 90% correct recognition of tanks in the lab, it was have, falling like to dire uh, bad performance in the field. And when they revisited that, so nobody really knows if it's just a meme or if it's true or not, but they discovered that all the tank pictures had bad weather in the background, that the sky was gray in all these pictures that they used for training. And whenever they were putting the, the system in different weather conditions, the system would break down. So what the system was doing was not actually recognizing tanks, it was recognizing the background. This is Hans the Horse. Anybody heard about Hans the Horse? So Hans the Horse is a horse who could do mathematics. You would ask Hans the Horse how much is 2 plus 2, and the horse would tap his hoof four times, and people were like, oh my god, this horse can do mathematics. And so this guy with the, with the lab coat, uh, uh, Dr. Oskar Funkt, uh, tried to understand what the horse was actually doing. How did that trick happen? And uh, it turns out that uh, the horse was picking up on the uh, reactions of the audience. 
when he was coming close to the solution, people would go, you know, would have a kind of like a wave of excitement. And that's what the horse was uh, reacting to. And the owner of the horse himself, that was not a scam. Like the guy who trained the horse was genuinely thinking that the horse could do mathematics. So this concept of the horse was uh, used by a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Bob Sturm, uh, who wrote, uh, who was uh, doing machine learning for music genre recognition. And he wrote that very interesting article, The Horse Inside Seeking Causes Behind the Behaviors of Music Content Analysis System. So in this diagram, um, you have uh, music genres, um, okay, uh, so certain number of files of each genre on the x-axis, and then uh, you have their tempo in the y-axis. And what Bob uh, demonstrated is that um, because the music genres, at least in that database, were very correlated with the tempo, if you were perturbating the tempo in a way that valves would still be valves, but faster or slower, people, listeners would still rate it as valves as a genre. Uh, the system who were doing genre recognition where, again, the, the, the performance would completely uh, be voided um, uh, and because the system was not doing actual genre recognition, it was doing tempo recognition, which is a subtly different thing. So there is one crucial question here, which is, will your system learn the claim task? Is your system really doing what you think it does? Uh, and, and you have to be careful because machine learning, no matter which, you know, system, algorithm you're using, could be DNNs, could be Gaussian mixtures, could be support vector machines in the olden days, could be all sorts of things. It will always learn something regardless of the model architecture. So yes, of course, we get excited about the model architecture, but something which is really important is to evaluate your model. Whereas a badly trained model is what it is, it's just not going to perform very well. If it's badly tested, it might be a horse. You, you, you can't, if you don't pay attention to the way you evaluate, it might be, you, you might be doing self-deception. The system might be doing something, but it might be doing something completely different than what you think it's doing or what you self-persuade yourself that it's doing. So it, it belongs to you to break your system to really prove that it's doing what it's doing. And for that, in that sense, evaluation metrics and testing data are crucial to maintaining this type of objectivity. So we're gonna talk about now uh, metrics uh, and data. So um, in terms of evaluation design, what defines best system? We say we want the best system, best, 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 so, but okay, what does it mean to do the best system? And that's a crucial question because if you have a baseline system, uh, system N, and then you have two candidates for your, for your next generation, you want to make sure that your next candidate is not going to regress, is going to be the best one that you can choose. But again, what, best, what does that mean? So first of all, you have to question whose objectivity you want to satisfy. Is it the technical scientist objectivity? Do you just want to satisfy percentage of performance? Or do you want to satisfy the user of the product? And there is a subtle difference because system behaviors uh, impact user experience in various ways. First of all, users don't like errors. Um, some of you might have uh, read the book from Daniel Kahneman. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow. Daniel Kahneman uh, was the forefather of a discipline called behavioral economics, where he showed that human cognition is biased um, in, in particular ways. Uh, and in particular, loss aversion tells you that if you, um, if you lose $20, you're going to be uh, uh, co comparatively more sad than what you would be happy when you find uh, $20. So humans are, uh, uh, resent the uh, loss a bit more or uh, that, than, than they are happy with against. And that is related with our evolution as a species. I mean, we, 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 don't, we, we are more kind of uh, fearful of danger uh, than, than we are, uh, you know, than excited by happiness. So that's loss aversion. Now, fortunately for sound detection, the errors of sound detection are, are fairly well defined. You have only two types of errors. That's errors that's general for any detection system type one and type two, you have the misdetections, the thing that you should have detected but didn't detect, or the false positives, the thing which were detected but were, which were not what you wanted to detect. We're going to come back to that. Uh, this type of errors can be repacked, repackaged into measurements called precision and recall, which give similar information but packaged in a different way. Precision and recall are a bit more difficult to interpret uh, in terms of your experience, but misdetections and false positives are clearly uh, errors that people can identify as such. Uh, but uh, not all errors may have the same impact. Uh, so there is a cost on user opinion, which uh, is meant to, to model those behavioral economics. So uh, cross-triggering, for example, matters. If you uh, recognize um, 
a, a baby cry, if a baby cry was detected as a dog bark, that's more damageable to the op opinion the user is going to have about your system than if you uh, were telling the user, I'm not sure if it's a baby cry or a dog bark. So uh, sometimes it's better to say, I, I don't know, than to say something which is blatantly wrong because it's another class of interest for your system. Um, and you might want to include that into the way you design your uh, metrics. Uh, again, I will give examples of that. Uh, also for detection systems such as uh, wake word detection or sound detection, um, you have a notion of system sensitivity and uh, error trade-off. So detection systems which are based on a threshold, uh, you, you can tune that threshold to make the system either more permissive or uh, more sensitive. And that uh, entails a trade-off between false positive and misdetection. Let me go into more detail about that um, in this uh, particular slide. So um, in this uh, diagram, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, but the gray zone is a sound, okay? This uh, thin line, uh, sorry about the resolution, but uh, so the, which uh, from red goes to blue is the score of the system. Well, in that case, the score is um, analogous to a distance. Like the lower the score, the closer your sound is to what you have modeled. So say if it's a baby cry, uh, this one is probably more like a smoke alarm. Um, uh, in, in the zone in the middle, the system detects that it's a smoke alarm because the score, score goes down. Now, those three purple lines, dotted lines, uh, dashed lines, sorry, are three levels of sensitivity of your system. So if you bring the sensitivity down, you are making your system more conservative in that case. If your threshold is very high, you're detecting the whole sound. If you lower your threshold to certain zone, you might start losing some information about the, 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 your detection. And then if you make your system, you lower your threshold very low, then you, have, you might have only a small parts of the sound which are being detected. So you can think of that as a sort of tap, a sensitivity tap that you open or close depending on whether you want to make your system more sensitive or uh, more conservative. And that is without retraining anything. This is just system tuning at this stage, yeah? So if you have a system which is, um, uh, which is uh, um, permissive, okay, you open your sensitivity tap, you have lots of the detections which are going through, uh, but the problem with that is that you might have lots of false positives. If you make your system more conservative, so you close your sensitivity tap, you are going to uh, reject more of the false positives, okay? You're gonna make less false positives, but you might also have more misdetections. So there is perpetually that trade-off between false positives and, and misdetections in, um, in detection systems. You can model that with a curve, which is called the ROC curve, uh, receiver operating uh, characteristic curve, okay? And so uh, when you open or close your tap, you are actually moving along that curve, okay? So if you have, uh, in that case, a sensitive system, uh, so which might detect a lot of your true positive, so say 98% true positive, that comes at the cost of having 80% uh, false positives. So if the false positives are the thing that you're trying to optimize, that's not a very good system. Now, if you were making, closing your sensitivity tab to make your system more conservative, okay, you might lower the false positive rate to say thereabouts of say, I don't know, 5%, but then you would also um, destroy your performance when it comes to true positive rate. So when you tune your system, you want to uh, set your uh, trade-off between, um, between uh, the two types of errors uh, in, in a place where you have a kind of balance of errors between both in a way that satisfies your customers. So um, now that is system tuning. Uh, uh, you really make your system better when you move the whole curve closer to the origin. So when you train a new system or when you test a new uh, architecture, what you want to see really is the whole curve going towards the uh, upper left uh, corner. But the idea here is when you are evaluating the system, uh, measures such as the F-score, for example, which give you only one operation point, are not very informative because uh, it's more informative to know where the system sits along the ROC curve. Uh, that is what matters for user uh, experience. So in order to uh, exploit this in the tuning our, our, uh, of, of our systems, we've uh, designed a analytic uh, evaluation framework called PSDS, the Polyphonic Sound Detection Score. Um, the details of that are on the article that uh, we uh, sent you uh, as a companion to this course. This article was uh, um, published at ICASP Conference 2020. It's also available on, on Archive. I'm just gonna zoom through all of that. If you want the detail, it's all uh, in, the, in the article. It's a bit technical article. So. Uh, if you have questions about uh, that uh, just after this slide, 
um, I'll take them. So essentially, uh, we start uh, by um, measuring the uh, uh, numbers of uh, detections in, in the data, okay, at various points of uh, sensitivity uh, of, of the system that we are evaluating. So we start evaluating one system. Uh, it used to be that people were using the boundaries of detection uh, to uh, indicate if a, if a detection was, uh, um, uh, was uh, if a sound was detected or not. We have uh, reformulated that in terms of intersection between the detections and the labels uh, in the data. And that has advantages in terms of robustness. This way of, of uh, calculating your detections is more robust against labeling uh, errors in the data. So we have a robust definition of true positives and false positives. With that, we draw the ROC curves. Uh, so imagine this is a three class system. I don't know, baby cry, dog bark, and smoke alarm say. And each of the classes is gonna have its own ROC curve, uh, which shows us uh, the, 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 the trade-off across all the possible regimes of operation uh, for each of these uh, three classes. Now, uh, uh, again, we, we say that uh, cross triggers uh, are important. Uh, so we roll in information about the cross triggers by having this um, weighing term here. Uh, we calculate cross trigger rates. We calculate cross triggers um, between the, 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 the sounds and the labels across classes. Uh, and we uh, um, uh, add that information in a way that is, we can modulate. Either we, if we don't want to uh, uh, roll in the cross trigger information, we set that alpha CT to zero. Uh, if we want to have uh, to find the system which makes the least cross triggers, then we, we boost that alpha CT to find, to, to put some emphasis on the information about cross triggers. So there we have a way to tailor the, the uh, evaluation to what we really want to see in terms of evaluation for the customers, for the users. And that's going to bring the, the curves a bit down because we, we uh, in doing that, we uh, uh, add extra false positives, which are the, of a particular nature of being cross triggers. Then we can I ask um, a question. Sure. Yes. So, in terms of tuning in in the real life, how is this tuning done? Because there's so many different, so many different deployment situations, right? Mm -hmm. So, how do you sort of tune this? So we have specifications for our customers. They they desi they they desire uh, uh, so many um, false positives per month, usually or per year. Um, and uh, we have also uh, uh, requirements in terms of false positive rate, and we pinpoint the, the point which is the closest uh, to these requirements along the ROC curves. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, finish with this uh, PSDS uh, measurement. We uh, uh, summarize all the curves into one, we average the, the, the class curves into one curve, but we also roll in the uh, variability, the variance between curves, because a system where the, the, there is a lot of disparity of performance between classes is more likely to have one very, very bad class than a system where the, um, the performance is uniform or kind of fairly close across all classes. So, uh, and again, that's a tunable parameter. We, we might search actively for the system which, is, which has the most homogeneous performance across classes. And then once we have one single curve per system, then uh, in the last diagram, we're comparing two systems, the red one and the blue one. Um, uh, so it's not always the case that the uh, rock curves are separated. Sometimes they cross. So you might have uh, some, uh, the red system in that case is uh, better uh, when in the regimes where you want to have uh, low numbers of false positives, slightly better. And then uh, in the regimes where you want to have um, more, a better uh, true positive performance, then you're going to choose the blue system. So, so system you choose might also depend where you want to be on the, on the ROC curve. Those are just hand-drawn uh, examples, okay? Uh, but they, they, they make that point uh, or about uh, your system might depend on your operation point. And also you want to, um, to um, look at the regimes which make sense from a standpoint of application. Above a certain amount of false positives per month or year, it doesn't even make sense to deploy the system. So uh, you want to uh, consider the system performance where it's useful to consider it. Uh, so that becomes a kind of analysis grid, as I said before, like you can modulate the meaning of what the best system is. And with those two parameters, alpha, and then some other parameters for the true positive and false positive, you can tailor the uh, evaluation to the uh, 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 things that really make sense for your users. But of course, all of that starts with data at the very, very root of all of that. As Vijay said before, we need proper data. So let's talk about data set design. 
Um, so in the case of sounds, um, uh, you have variability which is inherent to each of the sound classes themselves. You might have for dog sounds, you might have big dogs, small dogs. Uh, they, they have a different uh, shape of snout, some of them long, some of them short. That's going to impact the way they bark. They also have different instincts. So uh, inside a sound class, you have variability. Uh, there's not a lot of variability in babies, but there's a lot of variability in human speech. Uh, you might have also different patterns for beeps and so on. So each of the sound classes have uh, intrinsic variability. Then, as we said before, they're going to be uh, occurring in a particular environment. You might have, you know, wooden houses, concrete houses, soft furnishings, uh, office spaces, and so on. That's a component of variability. And then also the device variability is important. Um, the microphones, which are uh, in uh, mobile phones, are really different from the ones in set top boxes, here rolls, uh, and so on. So each of these devices is going to have different responses. So how do we deal uh, with this variability? So first of all, let's just illustrate uh, quickly the importance of that. Uh, the first nine sounds are the exact same sound captured through nine different devices. Yeah, so well, two years, I guess. Um, 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 so it's it's we can really hear that they do a different amount of equalization. Okay, some of them were losing the bass, some of them were uh, boosting the 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 um, trebles, um, and the three last one were having significant amount of noise. Two of them having white noise, one of them having electromagnetic noise. Uh, on top of that, uh, and this is the extent to which uh, different devices uh, are uh, modifying your, your sound. It's really tangible. The three next examples are um, someone shouting in three different rooms. It's, I think it's the same subject shouting. Um, Help me! Help! So kind of dry sound, not a lot of reverb. And the third one has really a lot of reverb. I think the third one was in a, in a public parking space, actually, with lots of concrete walls and reverb. So again, you can hear that the uh, environment really makes a difference uh, on the nature of the sound and, and what you're capturing in your audio. Uh, so again, illustrating the microphone uh, variability, this diagram, the blue thing with the yellow uh, in the middle, uh, is a study we uh, led on about 30,000 microphones, which were exact same model from the exact same manufacturer. It's not even different models, different brands. It's in principle the same, but just uh, uh, produced, mass produced. Uh, and the, the difference, uh, you can see the variance of the microphone responses. There is a 10 dB uh, difference. The width of this um, diagram is 10 dBs, and that's a logarithmic scale. So that's a tremendous amount of difference of uh, the equalization produced by each of these microphones. You also have a couple of outliers at the bottom which are doing crazy, crazy things. So then we were trying to see if there were a kind of a, if there was a seasonality in the um, uh, kind of uh, in, the, in these equalization curves. Is if the uh, certain batches would be more consistent? Uh, so the blue diagram with the red line uh, on the uh, top right uh, is that is uh, each microphone in order of serial number, um, but it's still fairly random. Uh, you can see that some of the batches were worse than others, but uh, essentially, it's very, it would be very difficult to predict consistency between the different microphones. Um, and then um, the uh, Gaussian curve, uh, Gaussian density at the bottom is the, um, the loudness of each microphone out of the box. Um, and again, uh, you can see that the, the, the variance on that loudness was really, really wide. Uh, so you can't expect perfection in consumer electronic microphones. Uh, another thing which is important to, to keep in mind uh, is uh, so many people just go on the internet, fetch sound on you know, public databases uh, and use that for uh, evaluating a system. Uh, and we've seen customers of ours uh, just taking sounds from uh, say YouTube, for example, and then playing it back through a loudspeaker in a room to uh, do their testing, right? So, and we're having a hard time explaining uh, that it's not a good thing to do. If you are testing your system as it will be deployed, so you have your dog barking in a house, so you have your dog and room effects, that's going to be captured by the microphone of your target device, say you're testing a security camera. The on-chip uh, 
audio processing is going to add its own level of distortion and then that's going to reach uh, AI3 in that case the embedded sound recognition system and that's where you're going to make your decision about what's a true positive and a false positive. Now if you take internet audio and play it back as a test uh, audio okay from your dog from well, somebody's dog which was play which was barking in, in their own room they record it through a device which is unknown we most of the time it's going to be a mobile phone for uh, social media but we don't really know what it is uh, there is going to be audio processing on that particular device then that's going to be encoded to be uh, broadcast on the internet so mp3 AAC uh, that might be various bit rates you don't really you're not sure exactly what the bit rate is going to be uh, and then if you were playing that back you're going to use say a laptop and then a, a speaker uh, to play back your sound uh, and so if you were using directly your laptop speakers, that's going to be very, very bad quality. You might be using a high quality speaker, but even that you, you have to calibrate, you would have to calibrate it to do proper playback. Uh, and then on top of that, you're going to be, be, have a second set of room effects uh, if you are playing back one of your internet sounds. And that's before it reaches the microphone, the on-chip processing, and then your recognition system. So. Uh, internet audio uh, is, is not appropriate for, I hope that makes the point, I, internet audio is not appropriate for uh, system testing, especially if you're going to make your decisions of whether your system works or not based on that. Um, other problems with internet audio, uh, so you have licensing and ethical issues. First of all, when you collect data, you need consent from people you're collecting from. Um, uh, it's really important. Um, so that's the ethics um, uh, um, uh, of it. Uh, during the Second World War, all sorts of people, data was collected without their consent, and that, that led to really bad things. So now, the, in particular in Europe, the law uh, enforces obtaining consent for any kind of data that you are uh, uh, recording. Um, there is a law called the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, it also um, um, uh, imposes uh, good things, but which are constraints for the management of your data set. Uh, if users uh, require, re require the, uh, erase, erasing their data from your data set, they have a right to re request that you delete their data. So you need to be able to trace uh, data from your user in your system. Um, and all of that at the same time being um, non-identifiable data and so on. So it's quite complex. Can I but uh, clarification on that? Sure. Because in a way, if you want to be able to delete the data, then you need to know. It's, it's almost like you're intentionally asking them to capture uh, identifying marker, right? Oh, yes. So um, uh, we have uh, two types of uh, data processing people uh, in the company. You have the ones who have access to the system that could potentially trace back. Okay, most of the data we collect is non-identifiable to begin with because uh, most of it is uh, is uh, sounds. Is, you don't have any voice or any uh, names or any phone numbers being pronounced in the data. Okay, um, also in our case, um, in our case, uh, people sign off the, the the rights of the data to us. So we have a, a, a contract, and then people. Uh, I mean, again, they they give us uh, their consent to use their data. Uh, and and uh, uh, and they're welcome to check if they think it's uh, identifiable or not. But then past that, once the data is in Alexandria, uh, everything is hashed, uh, and we cannot like um, people who are going to train the machine learning system have no way to know whose data they are going to process or no way to trace it back to any identification. Uh, so there's really a kind of hermetic boundary between uh, traceability and uh, usage of data further down the line. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so um, also one important question. So of course, licensing ethical, but also is your data in domain or out of domain? So if you take data from YouTube, for example, most of it is going to be social media audio, uh, whereas what you really want your system to do is a smart device application. So, okay, this was the first picture that came out when I looked for social media um, in a database of, 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 of freely available pictures, but it's okay, this young lady is probably promoting cosmetics or something. That's gonna be a very different type of sound than what may happen in your uh, living room for safety applications or in your kitchen. Uh, you know, she, at the moment, uh, you can imagine that you won't necessarily have a microwave beep in, in that uh, uh, social medium uh, video. So there is a huge risk when you're using uh, internet data without caution that you're going to produce a horse. Okay, so be really, really careful. Be really cautious with that. Can I? Uh, absolutely, very, very good question. Excellent question. So, uh, 
so what we start with usually is random sampling of space. So as you say, there's lots of different sounds happening in life and human uh, scope of understanding, we can't imagine every sound happening. So um, you're not uh, always able to tailor uh, your, uh, your uh, to cover everything you want. So, so having a proportion of randomness of uh, letting your uh, data collection system uh, run free uh, is going to bring uh, innovation and surprise into your data. Uh, now, the pitfall with that is that you're not sure, I mean, uh, you have to be careful how you design this because you're not sure that letting your uh, system run free is going to cover um, uh, everything. Uh, I see a question from uh, Hossam. Let me just get through that slide and then, and then I come back to that if that's okay. Yeah. So, um, so you might want to put a little bit more control on uh, what you're recording. So you might want, for example, to let your system run free with your volunteers uh, in a variety of homes, but you might want to curate uh, your homes to be uh, uh, residential versus offices versus uh, uh, city center buildings and so on. And with that, you would still have a proportion, a kind of uh, um, compromise between uh, uh, calibrating what you're recording and let it, let it, letting it run free. At the extreme, you might want to select uh, to do uh, what's called the method of quotas. So what, that's what people do when doing, for example, political uh, polls. Um, you take uh, people with uh, different jobs and then different age ranges and you calibrate all of that so that although you know that uh, you don't have, um, it would be too much data to sample every possible combination, you know that you have organized your sampling grid in a way that covers uh, as widely as possible what you want to record. Now at this um, extreme side of control, uh, you really have, again, the, then, then you're in the pitfall of uh, if, if there is something that you left out because you didn't imagine that this would happen in real life, then you miss out. So, um, so the, the, uh, yeah. Um, one way to uh, guide differently your data collection is to build cohorts. So the blue dots in the middle of the, of the spherical uh, kind of, uh, random cloud are sounds of interest for your system. And then you might want to record sounds which, uh, as humans, you think are going to be uh, uh, close to these ones. For example, uh, crockery falling, so metal bits falling, uh, being an imposter for uh, your glass break, for example. Now, uh, again, it's a bit of a give and take because the, um, the, um, uh, that's what humans would think is close, uh, clo close I mean, near uh, uh, in the same, in the, in the acoustic space. And we might get that wrong. We might not have the right type of imagination about that. So another way to do it is uh, what's called active learning. Uh, now the, the, the pink dots are the detections that your system uh, are going to make of your target classes. And you can make your system uh, artificially permissive to record uh, actively uh, 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 the uh, sounds which are going to be closest in your acoustic space or closest in the sense that your model think they are the closest. Uh, so that's one way to guide the uh, data collection. Uh, but again, uh, there is a risk there. Um, which is that your system is going to get re reinforcing, self-reinforcing, because uh, you are, you, your system knows something and you're using that knowledge to gather more uh, uh, of, uh, of knowledge so that you have a margin of innovation and randomness around your system detections, uh, but you're not entirely sure if you don't have an outlier sound out there, which would still be a valid detection because your system starts from somewhere. So there isn't really a best strategy, all have pros and cons. And the best is to try to have a balance of, uh, between control and randomness. Control, if you do too much control, that might be a horse because you might be self-persuading yourself that your data set is the right one. Randomness uh, brings more surprise and innovation, but you need a lot more quantity of data to, uh, to cover the whole space. So there is a question there also, a very practical question, what can you afford? Because all of that has a cost. You're gonna have people running a microphone, you're gonna have labelers labeling and so on. So how much can you gather? And what is achievable practically? Can you co cover all combinations of all houses and microphones and stuff? Probably not. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And most uh, importantly, what are the biases of our data? Is it, did, you, did you cover all the houses or was it only the residential house? So uh, analysis of the biases is very important. So there was a question, sorry, what was it? Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. All very good questions. So precisely. So what do we do to make that tractable? At Audio Analytic, we uh, do the following thing. We collect the sounds in a dry environment, okay? We remove all the uh, room effects, I will tell you how. Um, and then we, remove, we, we, we collect independently the uh, room effects and the device effects. How do we do that? 
So we have designed and built a semi anechoic sound lab. Uh, reverberation time is there is not not 15 of a second. That's below every time constant you have in the in this system, and the frequency response is extremely flat. Uh, so essentially, people freak out when they stay too long in that room. You start hearing your heartbeat. You know, it's kind of like the, it's very very silent, and there is absolutely no sound bouncing from the wall. It's really strange. When if you we we have fired guns in there to to record, and the, the without the reverb, the, the sound really just sound like a champagne bottle. It's really strange. Um, uh, we have uh, another uh, fully anechoic chamber. Difference between semi-anechoic and fully anechoic is semi-anechoic. You have zones in the room which are fully anechoic, so you need to know what you're doing. Uh, fully anechoic, we use that one to measure the device responses. So we play uh, sweep tones and we rec uh, and, and these sweep tones in an environment which has absolutely zero influence from the environment because it's fully anechoic. Uh, and that way, whenever we get a new device, so to answer your question, whenever we get a new customer device, the first thing we do is we record the uh, response from that device, its self noise and whatever it's doing without any influence on the environment. Uh, and with that, once we have the response uh, of the room and of the device, we're able to use the convolution operation to simulate the environments, but simulate in a way that's extremely realistic. We've also done lots of studies of um, you know, to check that our uh, co convolution or kind of like the, the way we um, uh, uh, kind of reassemble the, the environmental response uh, with the original sounds, that this is extremely, extremely accurate. Uh, I see two questions. Uh, let me just finish this slide and then I'll take them. Uh, so you can see here, we've been uh, breaking glass in the semi anechoic room. Uh, we recorded the dogs through a variety of devices. So again, uh, the, the blue one is a perfect microphone. It's calibrated to have a completely flat response. Um, and then we compare that with uh, other devices that, that we receive from our customers. Uh, and in terms of intrinsic uh, variability, we've broken glass of different dimensions, thicknesses, and so on, different types of dogs. We have um, smoke alarms. We bought every single smoke alarm available in the US, uh, in, in uh, Europe, and in the UK, sorry, and in Australia, I think at the time. Um, so yeah, that gives you an idea of, of the type of, of things that, that, that we do. Uh, there were two questions. Okay, there we go. So with that uh, method, uh, so we, we have now uh, our data sets called Alexandria. It's the world's largest commercially exploitable data set for machine learning. It's bigger than uh, ImageNet, essentially. Um, it's got 15 million labeled sound events uh, across 700 label types. Uh, and we have the full data provenance and, uh, and ownership of the data. So we have every single piece of paper that people sign to, to, to uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, give us ownership of the data. And we've also um, uh, given um, compensation for the data collection uh, and so on. So um, we have a global network of volunteers across the world. Um, we, who we, we saw two for these data campaigns. Uh, we have dedicated data campaigns that we're organizing uh, and we use, uh, as I explained before, real world augmentation and labeling techniques. So we, we don't uh, augment the data in blind ways. We use real uh, environments and real devices to augment the data. And then on top of that, sometimes we do a bit more data augmentation, but uh, essentially this is very, very precise, very accurate uh, uh, way of uh, 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 simulating real world data. So just to summarize, uh, essentially we start from this dry uh, data, we convolve with a variety of rooms, devices, and so on. We add also uh, environmental uh, noise on that, uh, and that uh, ends up uh, augmented uh, training data, and then we uh, use that for model training and optimization. Okay. Um, so what now, uh, once we have the data, what is the best sound recognition model? So everybody is like, ah, oh, but which architecture are you using? So Think of it as an optimization problem. Given a realistic data set and a meaningful metric for sound classification, you search the space of DNA architectures and then you find the best performing architecture. I'm not gonna tell you which one is the best for us. It might be a different for you, okay? But uh, uh, I, I really wanna, uh, one of the messages which I'm really trying to get through in the community is that uh, the uh, system architecture, the DNN architecture doesn't matter as much as people uh, uh, are, are claiming it is. Sometimes you have very, very uh, similar performance with uh, DNS, which are very, very simple versus DNS, which are very, very big and complicated. Uh, so you, uh, it's really important to search the, um, the uh, space of architectures, and you can only do that if you have uh, realistic data and a meaningful metric. Um, 
So this, the searching your, your model space is what's called software 2.0 approach. Uh, and where the guided search, uh, in our case, we, 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 we baptized our, our, our architecture auditory net. Um, but again, it's the result of optimizing across uh, a very uh, precise uh, data. So um, don't worry too much about the amount of text in there. The, the interesting ideas uh, are, um, so uh, what uh, Jan Lequin and Andre Carpati were, were talking about a few years ago. So differentiable programming is that concept of having, uh, instead of programming something, you have a parameters, parameterized functional block. So you have your DNN layers with uh, weights, uh, weights and biases, which are your parameters of your, of your functions, functional blocks. And then you optimize uh, that with gradient-based optimization. Uh, Carpati uh, has a different way of explaining a similar thing, which is um, when you're programming something, say in Python or C or something, you're, you're focusing on one point, specific point in a program space uh, with some desirable behavior. So rather than doing that, why not uh, specifying some goal of the behavior of your program? You want your program to recognize sounds or recognize images or whatever. Uh, and then you um, specify uh, a skeleton of the code, okay? So in that case, that's going to be embodied by DNN architectures. And you identify a subset of program space to search. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and the search process can be made efficient with back propagation and stochastic gradient descent. So rather than programming something, you define a structure of program, a program space, and you search that. So that's particularly important when you want to make sound recognition tiny. Why? First of all, you have to uh, identify your product requirements. You might have a, 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 a finite uh, MIPS budget, the number of info, um, info instructions, sorry, per second that you're, that you're uh, allowed to use. Uh, you might have a RAM budget at runtime, so a particular, a finite number of parameters that you can have in your, in your uh, machine learning model, might be a DNN, might be something else. Uh, you might also have a program size constraints, which are slightly different from the RAM. So RAM is what happens on runtime. ROM is the size of your program. Um, uh, and then, um, so, so that's one thing which specifies the, the program space to a large extent. Also, you have to keep in mind that you might not be alone on that CPU. You might be sharing the uh, MIPS with other applications running on the same CPU. And, you know, sometimes people go, well, why don't we just use a, a bigger uh, chip? Well, no, you, you won't get a bigger chip. Most of your customers are going to come with a chip which was selected for its value for money, the number, the bank for buck uh, uh, in the bill of material that is the, the, the sum of uh, all the materials that went into making your product. And uh, you, you, uh, you cannot disrupt that because the uh, 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 device designers have designed that with a particular market in mind, with a particular price point at the end of the day that they need to sell the device. So you cannot ask your customer to double the price of their device in the market. So you have to cope with whatever uh, specifications they come up with. So these are the constraints that define your, your program space, okay? Um, and then you're going to optimize your, your uh, machine learning architecture to fit within that program, to search within that portion of the program space. Now, uh, software engineering matters, uh, quantization, so limiting the number of bits you use to encode your, um, your uh, uh, numbers, your math numbers, or using math approximations, for example, uh, Taylor series or various ways of, you know, various recipes to approximate certain functions, uh, it, it has, it is really, really useful to, to uh, help uh, uh, reclaiming some space in your, in your program space. Uh, if you do that, you have to manage the errors. You have to uh, manage the approximations that you're making when you're using, uh, sorry, the errors you, you're making that you're when you're using those approximations rather than using super precise floating point numbers. So you have three main approaches to, um, to get to a tiny model. Either you train in floating point and then you quantize. Uh, but then that means that you have to measure that uh, the approximations you use are not destroying the, the performance of your system. Or you can backpropagate directly the quantized model. So that has the advantage of um, including the management of errors into the training. Or you can use a technique called knowledge distillation where you train a big model and then you um, train a smaller model to uh, emulate the behavior, to copy the, the uh, input output scores of what your big model uh, is doing. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, again, in terms of engineering, you can also play with your uh, instruction sets. 
uh, in the sense that some chips come equipped with uh, digital signal processing operations or with parallel, parallel instructions. Uh, some uh, instruction sets are able to do four multiply ads with, with one operation, say. Uh, or you have now on the market what's called neural chips, which are essentially uh, math accelerators. They accelerate matrix multiplications. That's as simple as that. GPUs are doing that on a massive uh, scale. Uh, but you also have uh, now manufacturers making smaller neural chips to fit on uh, embedded devices, which have uh, you know, constraints in power consumption and so on. One thing which is interesting to keep in mind is also scalability. So it might be useful to uh, make uh, intentionally a very small system to work to the uh, lowest common denominator of the devices that you're uh, bound to work with. Uh, because if you can deploy on a small device, then you can deploy more instances of sound recognition on a larger device. And it could be the case that someday uh, we're going to run uh, this, that same uh, super quantized, super small code on in servers because then you would need one server instead of needing a, a whole farm of servers to do uh, the same amount of sound recognition. So uh, scalability is important to keep in mind and also flexibility in terms of um, you don't want your code and your, and your uh, in, the, in our case, sound recognition to be a rigid set of sounds. We, we want to be able to plug new models when the models become better or where we want to, our customers are asking us for new classes. We want to be able to uh, update the code without having to recompile and retest uh, the whole thing uh, all the time. So this is uh, scalability and, and flexibility is important for uh, Tiny Lab. All right, so we're getting close to the end. Just a word from the from the field, you know, from the you know troops. We we've been there, done that, you know. Uh, so what is a startup? So of course, at, at your level, you're interested in the technology. Um, we're talking about tiny ML, about programming, about DNNs, about data, and all of that. But uh, you might have the best system uh, in the universe if you if you can't communicate how good your system is. Uh, it, it doesn't exist. So having communication skills. Uh, it's very, very important when you're uh, running um, uh, a, technology, a technology startup. Also, you need resources. What are you going to eat while you're doing your programming and your trading and so on? How are you going to sustain yourself? You need an office unless you want to work on a cardboard box. Um, so you need uh, funding uh, and you need resources to get to the point where you want to be. And you need people. Some of these tasks are more than a one-man job. You need to be able to work with people on this kind of thing. But all of that at the center of all that, what you want to get to is a product. And I've included this slide because it's really important to understand the difference between the technology and the product. Uh, this might be the best floor cleaner um, in, in the universe, but unless you package it in a certain way, attractive colors, you talk about it and so on, it's not really a product. It has to be pleasing uh, people. So um, uh, uh, that comes with also a set of techniques. There is a kind of delta. There is some work to do to bring the technology to be a product. And in the end, the product is not about satisfying theoretical percentages of uh, flow cleaning accuracy. Uh, it's about satisfying the customer. You want your users of your system to be satisfied about the performance of the system. And all these elements we've talked about are participating into that idea that uh, technology is what it is, but you're making technology for people to use. You're making that technology for it to be useful for somebody. Uh, of course, it takes a lot of work, but at the same time, you know, we like, yeah, we did it. You know, whenever you've had a, like a massive campaign of, I don't know, retraining your system and so on, it's, it's a lot of satisfaction to be, uh, uh, you know, achieving these milestones uh, of, of development and improvement and customer deployment of our system. Okay, so takeaways from uh, this uh, class. So what does the real world mean? Um, with the, in the context of sound recognition, but again, you can generalize that to every other type of, uh, of AI. You have to understand the variability of your phenomenon and you have to understand your data space. What are the axes of variability? In audio, we talked about production processes, distortions from the environment and the devices. In image uh, recognition, that might be reflection, shading, tones, uh, imperfect com commercial grade cameras uh, and so on that you're gonna have to deal with. It's important to design the evaluation protocol carefully. Um, how you design your metrics uh, and, and are you designing your metrics for uh, technology or for your customers. What is it that you're aiming to optimize? And sometimes that last mile between the percentage of accuracy and the user opinion is the hard thing to, to measure and to achieve. Yeah. So it's important to keep that in mind and to make an effort to satisfy, again, satisfy the customer. Um, and of course, what you want to avoid is you want to avoid the horse. You really want your system to do what it says on the team. You don't want to do all the effort of developing it. You put it on the field, it, it doesn't work. You really want to 
uh, 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 ensure, uh, I mean, Bob Sturm was saying, a, a system is a horse until proven otherwise. So it belongs to you to, to disturb your system, to make sure that it does what it says on the team. How do you get the data is an important question. What's the size of the collection space? What's the appropriate collection strategy? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. It might be a blend of things. Again, you have to avoid horses. Of the shelf data may not be appropriate. It might be uh, um, uh, having uh, biases that you didn't think through. So it's really important to identify and to study and to, and to um, uh, dig as deep as you can in terms of identifying potential biases uh, in your data. So once you have your data and a realistic performance metric, then you are into model optimization. The DNN architecture is a result of searching the program space uh, and data and performance metric, I would, I would argue that they are more essential than the type of architecture that you're going to end up with. You might end up with the most mundane architecture, but if it's the one that gives you the best performance that satisfies the customer, then why not? Um, and uh, software engineering and model optimization work hand in hand. So resorting to these, you know, quantization approximation technique is something you're going to hear a lot uh, throughout, I think, the whole uh, TinyML course. Um, and then in the end, uh, what you want to get to is a product. And, and all these elements of, uh, uh, you know, metrics, objectivity, and so on, are uh, to get to something that works in the field to, to, that somebody will want to, to buy because they, they find it's useful. Don't leave it at just percentages of um, accuracy. Thank you very much. I hope that was uh, useful. Um, and uh, yeah, I can take questions if you want. Thank you. Sacha, thank you so much. That was that was awesome. And in case you're wondering if uh, there are fewer people, it's because uh, folks have another class to run to, so folks are dropping. But thank you again. Thank really for, appreciate for it. Overrun.